see you this morning. How are you doing this morning? Got some rest over the weekend, the long weekend? Well, recovered from the science exam. How was that? Very manageable, I hope. Good, yes. Are you healthier than you were last week? I noticed last week's lecture, a lot of people coughing and hacking away and sniffling. Things are doing a little bit better. I sense that today, a little more life in the crowd. As we settle in and settle down. We're coming to a turning point in this humanities section. We're coming to the end of the first section of the humanities series, which is that section of the two ancient civilizations I thought this would be a good time to take five minutes and see where we are, ask why has this been important, and just take a glance at what we have coming up. We're moving, at the end of this week, moving from the ancient Israelite world to the Greek world. So this is a very good point to take a deep breath and ask where have we been and where are we going. Where have we been? First of all, we can say that we've looked at two civilizations with common roots. Civilizations both from ancient Mesopotamia. What have we seen in these common roots? We've seen the emergence of cities. We've looked in Gilgamesh at a civilization where the first cities to appear on Earth appear. What else have we seen? We've seen another group that branched out of this civilization, a group of wanderers, a group of nomads, and the appearance of a calling, a special calling. And we've looked at the moment of change, the change from the wanderers to the kingdom. And we've looked at the pluses and the minuses of that. If you think about good old Samuel, who says, let me warn you, things will be bad in this transition. And we've looked at how that group coped with that, dealt with that, and turned the bad as much as they could into good as well. These two civilizations, we've said how they make sense of themselves. We've asked, how do they understand themselves in a larger context, in terms of nature, or in terms of the gods, or in terms of God? And finally, in these two civilizations, we've seen one that has endured, even to this day. And we've seen how they've endured, not through conquest, but through principles through common beliefs, common practices, and a common faithfulness that is often severely tested and severely questioned. What else have we seen? We've seen a sweep of 1,500 years here in this first month and a half. That's about 100 years for each week, uh, or uh, about uh, longer than that even. You who've taken that science exam can figure that out exactly, longer than that, 1,500 years. We've looked back at 2000 BC, the epic of Gilgamesh. We've looked at roughly 2000 BC, if the patriarchs lived, if Abraham, and if Isaac, and Jacob, if those people whose legends are contained, whose stories are contained in Genesis, that's when they would have lived, about 2000 BC. And we've moved forward. We've looked at the historic period of the ancient kingdom, and we can put a date on that, 1000 BC. That's the prime time of Saul and David and Solomon. And we've looked at the time of the prophets. We think about Professor Fredrickson's lecture, and we think of that date, 586, when the Babylonians invaded Israel and killed and burned and enslaved the Israelites. And we've looked at the response of the prophets to that, and we've heard questions of Job in that as well. How can God allow this to happen to a good people? So we have looked at a sweep of time. We've looked at the 1,500 years of that period. We're moving toward a period of about 100 years to look at as we move toward ancient Greece. We will be looking at a period, well, roughly 750 BC, the time of Homer, but especially the 400s as we look at the greatness of that century. Why does this matter? Why does this first month, this first look at the peoples and the civilizations and the works, why does this matter today? 
Gilgamesh, the epic of Gilgamesh, looks at human questions. When you strip away power, when you strip away comfort, when you strip away illusions that allow us to be comfortable, what remains? That's the question of Gilgamesh, and that matters. What are the human questions? Even when you defy the gods, what remains? What defines our experience on Earth in human terms? Secondly, from ancient Israel, why does this matter? From ancient Israel, we have the question, are there principles that should guide humans other than the quest for power? Are there principles above us? Are there principles beyond us? Are there things beyond just greed and power that should guide humans? We've looked at a world the Israelites saw as good, created by a creator who calls it good. We've looked at a world where humans fit in in a clear way into that world the creator calls good. And we've looked at a world in which there are moral commandments, not just laws. So that's the question we take, one of the many questions we take from ancient Israel. And I think of one moment that illustrates this. Are there principles other than power according to which we should live? I think of one moment in those passages. It's the moment where Nathan confronts David and tells him the story of the rich man who didn't need anything more and the rich man takes from a poor man for his own pleasure, for his own power, his own greed. <coughs> David is powerful. He's the mighty king. He has also taken Bathsheba and has been responsible for the death of Bathsheba's husband. But he hears that story and he discerns the principle and he says that man is wrong. And Nathan says, you are that man. And we take from that one episode, principles higher than just the quest for power. The events of our world, the events of one month ago today, and all the events that lead to all the uncertainties since that event make these questions, I think, more pressing. Questions about <coughs> the role of education, purpose, the value of why we gather here every week and why we gather in our classes daily. <clears throat> I think about King Gilgamesh, the man who grasps for immortality blindly and in a kind of unreflective way. His world is shaken and he discovers fragility and loss and grief. The book teaches us something more, though. It teaches us what Gilgamesh learns in the face of uncertainty. And what Gilgamesh learns in the face of uncertainty is the power of friendship and the power of love and something that is enduring even longer than an individual's life that's embodied by the walls of the city. So when we say, why does this matter, I think even in the only two civilizations that we've looked at in a month and a half, we can have some very firm answers of why this matters. <coughs> we finish up this section this week, as I say, we'll be headed to the world of Greece to a hundred year period of glory, and we will be focused on storytelling and on performance and on speculation. Very different focus from where we have been, a focus as essential and as intriguing as where we have been, and I think it's something truly to look forward to. I'm very pleased to introduce to you today Professor Ellie Wiesel. Many of you know Professor Wiesel through that small book, Night, which carries a deep impact. It's a memoir of darkness. Many of you perhaps know that he is the author of many other books and many other kinds of books as well, some 45 plus books, novels, commentary on world events, commentary on the scriptures, essays, 
Biblical Criticism. The second volume of Professor Giselle's memoirs has recently appeared in English after first having appeared in French. He is the recipient of many commendations and prizes. I will mention two. 1992 President George Bush Sr. awarded Elie Wiesel the Presidential Medal of Freedom. And in 1986, Professor Wiesel was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. Elie Wiesel continues to be a voice of conscience and a man of true courage in a world that too often puts power above principles. Professor Wiesel is a member of our faculty. He is the Andrew Mellon Professor in the Humanities in the University Professors. Please join me in welcoming Professor Elie Wiesel. Which is good. It's good because it brings us already forward. 
then we have the story of Cain and Abel. And there again, I have problems with Cain and Abel. When you study the text, Cain was right. I feel sorry for Cain. Cain one day had an idea of bringing offerings to God. And for reasons, it's not in the Bible. Other texts, we do find reasons. God rejected Cain's gesture. So how could he not be with him? Simply God said no. Not only that, Cain actually did something which no one had done before him. He took something that was his and said, God, thank you for being God. And I give you something. And God said no. Then came Abel, you know, a young kid who imitates his brother. He also wanted to bring offerings, and God said, okay, I'll take you. Why was God so unfair to Cain? Then Cain, angry, killed Abel. That was the first death in religious history. The first death was a murder. And some murder. Two brothers, one was a victim, and the other one his assassin. The problem is not only with God, with the parents as well. At that time, there was nobody else. There were four human beings uh, inhabiting, inhabited. The whole world was inhabited only by these four, the parents and two young kids. Where were the parents? When Cain and Abel argued, why didn't they intervene? Oh, children, don't fight. I have a headache. <laughs> Come on, why didn't they do that? Where were the parents? Should we say, therefore, that this is the first failure of education? But parents did not intervene when children were fighting. And what is the story all about? And why is it there at the beginning, clearly, of history or what? I must tell you, I studied it with a heavy heart, not understanding. But then maybe it is to teach us something that is happening now. Brothers can become enemies. And when they are enemies, they are the worst of enemies. <coughs> when strangers are enemies, it's different. But when brothers hate one another, and when brothers kill one another, then you have almost something theological in that act. Is that what the text wants to show us, to teach us? Maybe it's something else, maybe something even more important. That whoever kills, <coughs> kills his brother. In that case, my good friends, open the newspaper today. How many brothers are being killed then? By how many other brothers? Are they, by the way, are they still our brothers? Which is a very important question. Is the person who commits murder ugly, vicious, brutal murder? Is that person my brother? Only because we had the same grandparents? But if he's not my brother, who is he? My cousin? Surely not my friend. Further on, I go from chapter to chapter, character to character, and each time I'm, you know, as, as really as a teacher, as a student, I'm first a student, then a teacher, and as a writer, I'm amazed at, by the way, the density of that text. Like you, I have studied uh, the, the religious texts from various religions. I'm always amazed and, and full of admiration when I have such a text. And, and, but then, you know, we Jews are being called the people of the book. But you know who called us like that? Mohammed. He called the people of Israel the people of the book. And we, we take that book so seriously that I think like the Quran for Islam, when it falls to the ground, you must kiss it. The book, just the book, you must kiss it. If, suppose the Torah, which is the five the scrolls, the five books of Moses, if the scrolls fall to the ground, any person who is present at that scene must declare a day of fasting and observe mourning. 
that is the the, the, the extraordinary passion we invest in this text. And therefore, when you study it, you find so many things there. I'm sure you will find similar things when you study Homer now, as I hear. It's still not the same. So, the next story is Noah. I, I don't know what you felt. I don't like it. I really don't like it. It's so passive. It is so passive. Whatever God says, he said, okay. Really, come on. Be a man. Fight. Come on, fight. Do something. Speak up. Whatever, whatever. Build an ark, build an ark. Put everything in the ark, in the ark. God was very clever in all this, after all. <laughs> God gave him a private circus. The ark became a circus, a floating circus. And then when God said after 40 days, okay, leave the ark, you have the ark. Why didn't he, why didn't he argue, say, Mr. God? Come on, really. If the people sin, they deserve to be punished. But why the children? Why the children? Why the innocent? You cannot just publish. You, you believe in corrective punishment? You, God. And if you do, why shouldn't I? But I don't believe in corrective punishment. I don't believe in corrective guilt. I believe only the guilty are guilty. So how can I accept the story of love? By the way, there's a very beautiful Talmudic commentary, which is very beautiful. But after the flood, all of a sudden, God, uh, Noah says to God, why did you do that? <coughs> Bless you. And God says, now you are asking. God is right. He should have asked earlier. So I don't like him. <laughs> it's my right. I'm entitled to my right. I don't like him. Furthermore, worse, much worse. Okay, he saved himself and his family. And what does he do? First he brings an offering to God, it's the least he can do. But then he got drunk. Now, to have survived such a cosmic tragedy, to get drunk, <laughs> no, write a poem, build a school, say something, no, say something, something which should remain forever. It's gravely in the heart of every person who will ever read the book. Nothing, he got drunk. <laughs> so how can I like it? Then God <clears throat> Clement and he says, you see the rainbow? At that time the rainbow had no political implication. Thank God. So God says, see the rainbow? I see the rainbow. This will be a sign of my uh, covenant with you. Never again did I destroy the world with floods. I remember the first time I read it, I felt, no, tonight I can sleep quiet. But you know how it is. To study a text is to read it again, and again, and again. And each time you find layers of meanings there. And that is an adventure. To me, the great adventure really is to read an old text. <coughs> I said, hey, 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 God used my print. God said, I shall never destroy the world with water. But I mean, with water. Now we know, for instance, that the world is threatened by fire, by nuclear fire. Why didn't God simply say, I promise you, no, I will never destroy the world again? Then I would have liked God and no. I said, again, and then I understood actually. The emphasis is on I. And God said, I will not destroy the world. And if the world is to be destroyed, with your fault not mine. Don't. I say this because these days, with what happened a month ago in New York, I was there. All that's happening in the Middle East and Israel. All of a sudden you hear theological outcries. And I understand it. Believe me, I do. There was God, my God, and God, you know. You cannot not ask the question. God, since God is present in history, God is, in a way, also responsible for history. But to say that God alone is responsible, that's too easy. It's absolutely too easy. A 
And where am I in all that? I cannot simply say, if I do something wrong, surely, God, you made me do something wrong. And that is, I believe, the message in Noah. That means, look, the world, I created the world for you. And the world can be a beautiful world if you leave it beautiful. Don't destroy it. How does one destroy the world? By violating the humanity and the dignity of one person, almost one person. Don't go to hundred one. And the five thousand seven hundred are killed, it's five. And here we come, where do I analyze it? There, I have big problems too. The problems I'm sure you studied when you, when you studied that chapter. God <coughs> said to Abraham, whom he had already tested nine times, one morning he said, I want you to bring me your son Isaac as an offering. And Abraham said, Okay. Once with me, he gave me, okay. Everything around there. That, by the way, Kierkegaard, which I'm sure you have read, in the of he is probably one of the best who, 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 who dealt with that problem. Everything in that story is so pure, so tense with meaning. It's really fear and trembling. You fear for everybody. You fear for Isaac. You fear for Abraham. You fear for Sarah. And you fear for God. What kind of God is this who wants a father? to kill his son. How can God be God if he asks for that? Sarah, you know, is the one that I like most. Because she was asleep when Abraham left, Abraham and Isaac left. But Abraham and Isaac left in the morning because it was clear had Sarah been awake, she would never have allowed Abraham to do what he was going to do. So she was asleep. And for three days and three nights, Abraham and Isaac, father and son, almost hand in hand, silently went to Mount Moriah. Silently. Only once or twice, there was a kind of short exchange when Isaac says, wanted me to come with you to bring a sacrifice, but where is the land? You cannot sacrifice it without the land to be sacrificed. I believe that Abraham from the very beginning knew he wasn't going to do it. He would not do it. And there, this is not the time for it. I could bring you all the texts, written in the commentaries, to prove my point. It was a double test. Just as Abraham was testing, as God was testing Abraham, Abraham was testing God and saying, let me see if you really want me to go through with it. Therefore, in the middle of the chapter, when a voice from heaven said to Abraham, oh, stop. What do you mean? A voice from heaven? Why not God? God asked Abraham to go and kill his son. Slaughter him. The knife was ready, the fire was ready, the altar was ready. And all of a sudden it's an angel? My answer is because God was embarrassed. He lost the fight. And therefore, in all the commentaries we find, we find extraordinary dialogues. Abraham in the, in the commentary says, oh no. You told me, God, to do it, I am going to do it, unless. And, and then Abraham sets conditions. Unless you satisfy my conditions, I am going through with it. And let's see what will happen. So God gives in. It's one lesson. God gives in occasionally. You may stand up to him. But only when it is for someone else's sake, not for your own. And here we come to Job. 
Job is, in our tradition, compared to Abel. Strange, strangely enough, of all the people in the Bible, Job is compared to Abel with one difference. Uh, Abel was tested, Job was tested. The difference is, <coughs> Abraham, when he spoke to God, and he quarreled with God, it was to save Sodom. Sodom was not inhabited by just people, by nice people, by hospitable people. If Abraham came to the defense of Sodom, he came to the defense of the sinners of all the sinners, the worst of all people. And he took God to task. Job protested only when he was involved, when he was victimized, when he suffered. That's a difference. But nevertheless, Job's questions are good questions. <coughs> when you study Job, as you have, you really wonder what is happening in the whole story. What was it? A game? A gambling match between God and Satan? God couldn't have found another contestant, another interlocutor. God should play with Satan. And what was the, the game about? About Job, who was a fearful man, who was a God-fearing man a just man, there was no way of thinking that the text tells us that, that Job was not a perfect, a perfect human being, an example to all human beings. And God said to Satan, go ahead and do what you want with him. And it's not as simple as that. Even that is not as simple because who were the real victims? His children. His children died because God and Satan had a game. <coughs> and then when Job finally, when Job finally came to the end of the other dialogue with his friends and then with God, nobody bothered to tell him, my dear Job. You did nothing wrong. It was only a game. Don't you think that any one of us is entitled to truth? Don't you think that, that Job was entitled to his truth? He must have, he was, we find it. He was worried. Maybe I had done something wrong. So wrong that my children had to pay the price. So why didn't God tell him? If not God, somebody else, an angel, not an angel. If not an angel, then. And they are, you know, jobless. To send an angel and say, my dear Job, listen, believe me, maybe it's wrong, but God wanted to test him. But, but who, whom did God want to test him, Job? Or Satan? Maybe the story really is a test of Job, who Job was then as only a means. It was God who tested Satan, who wanted to vanquish Satan. But then the whole book is extraordinary. Now, I'm sure you have heard it from, from my colleague who spoke about Job. In our tradition, Job is not Jewish. Job is mentioned as a, a great spirit, a great human being, a prophet to the nations, even the, as a messiah of and off and to the Gentiles. Nevertheless, his book is in the canon. And more than that, for our holy days, high, high, high holy days, which is for New Year and Day of Atonement, we mainly use references taken from Job to describe our, <coughs> our suffering. When we plead to God, we quote Job, and he wasn't Jewish. Now, what does that mean also? It means that Job was not Jewish, but his suffering concerns me. And when someone suffers, I must be present to that person who is suffering, irrespective of his or her religion, 
or ethnic origin or anything. Is this a lesson of Job? Oh, it has many despairing moments. I have, in all my writing, celebrated friendship. To me, friendship is, is what, what turns the human being into a source of transcendence. I, in a way, I, 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 I celebrated it even more than, than love. It was so respectful. People celebrate love, I felt I don't have to add to it. They even practice it. But friendship is different. So I celebrate, and here in the book of Job, friendship doesn't have a good name. These friends are horrible. What they are doing to Job, this poor Job, I think he suffered more from them than from Satan. He suffered, and they explained to him he suffered. So, what did they say? Come on. You suffer, that means that you are guilty. He said, guilty of what? And they said to me, I don't know what. But you are guilty because the proof you suffer. Thank God. But God himself, at the end, reprimands that in friends. He said, I don't need you. Come on, I don't need you. If you are my defender, then go to me. I don't need you. And he turns, therefore, and becomes a friend at the end of Job. What about Job himself? Did he keep his faith? Did he lose it temporarily? Faith in whom? Faith in his friends, surely not. Faith in God? Faith in the future? So at the end, you know, we have this Hollywood story that he married again, that he or by the, by the way, they also be he didn't marry again, but he simply went back to his wife, who is the most subtle and, and beautiful figure in the whole book. I, I always, I always feel that we are unfair to her. Because she is there, she suffered as much as he did. Her children too were killed. Her house also burned down. And the whole book is about him, not her. How far can you go in macho? You know? Only because he was a male? What about her? In the beginning, when she says to him, Elohim, curse God and die. First case of mutilation. Go and die. You mean go and die? He didn't want to die. Furthermore, in Hebrew, Barich means bless God. And we turned around and we say she said, curse God. Maybe she simply said, no, she said, bless God. And show God that although you suffer, your faith is intact. Go ahead, it's, it's noble, it's beautiful, why curse? But then he answered, said also, I don't like the answer. He said, you speak like one of the wretched people. Why wretched? Even he was unfair to her. The only time when I feel that Job is wrong is when he spoke to his wife. More respect more affection, more love, more faith. There is one sentence in one verse in the book, which actually is the key. In Hebrew it goes like that, hey, Iktar lady, even if I were to be killed, lo ayacher, I shall continue to long for him, meaning for God. Or I shall pray to him, or I shall love him. This is the meaning. But law in, in Hebrew can either be him or no. And therefore the translation can go both ways. He can say, let him kill me. Nevertheless, I shall worship him and remain faithful to him. Or it can be, let him, let, let him kill me. Let, I, let me be killed. But I shall not go on loving him anymore. I shall stop. And in this ambivalence, in this ambiguity, in this paradoxical attitude towards the absolute, we find the problem of Job with our own. And today you have whatever tragedy on such scale occurs. You hear people ask these questions, what about how do you explain evil in history? How do you human nature? How do you stop it? What is 
the limit? How far may you go to stop evil without committing it? These are very tough problems. To my young friends, this century is your century. And I know that this time, you are concerned about that. So I, I live among you more than before. You are concerned with what's happening in the world. The reason is your world. So what you are learning here, be it Isaac, be it Joe, or being Plato and Homer and Gilgamesh, use it to make the world a little bit warmer. Yes, please. Give me your name. Amy. Amy. Sure, it's necessary. The question is about answer, about reconciling all the difficulties in, in biblical text, for instance, right? I, I, I cannot reconcile them really because all I do for myself is I, I deepen the question, and the question each time becomes deeper and deeper, but I don't have the answers. I can have a superficial answer. The question is eternal, the answers are no. Nevertheless, must continue. Yes. You may. Oh, okay. Okay. Do you think God loves the people he's created? Does God love the people? You think I can speak for God? <laughs> <laughs> you heard the dean when he spoke, he said that God, when God created the world, he said it's good. It came to man, he said it's, it's very good. Talk about it's very good. I wonder what he meant, but very good. In French, you say, the mieux than me du bien. The very good is worse than the good. One thing I do, think, I, I do believe that God did not create human beings to make fun of them. I do believe in, in pathos, in God's pathos, that God, in a way, his own way, suffers with his children that they suffer. But this is not an answer, this is the question. Because in that case, how, do one, does, how is it possible? Possible, what about, what about the execution, the victimizer? Where is God there? We cannot say, since God is God, he's everywhere, and in every person. So I, I understand God is with the victim, the victim's need. What about the execution and God? I don't know. But deep down, I believe, really, that God, you know, we have all kinds of liturgical prayers, beautiful ones, that the comparison of God is like this, say, the navigator, and we are the, in, in a boat, and everything. But there is never any comparison saying, God is the toy maker, and we are these toys. Human beings are not toys. We are only toys in the hands of dictators. And they, for them, for a dictator to take a group and move the group away uh, and, and kill means nothing. Because I don't think that God, my meaning of what God should do is not that. The game, I don't know. Yes, please. You, please. Uh, Your name. Uh, Raj. Raj, yes. Um, 
David Seaman, strange enough, you know, I, years ago, in 85, I had a very big problem. He was, he was born to born that some of you. Uh, with President Reagan, he went to, a, he wanted to go to a certain place, to a cemetery with an SS, and I just spoke there, you know, the ceremony. And that's when I said, I belong to a tradition that commands me to speak truth to power. And it became, it took on. There are books now called Truth to Power. I love it. <laughs> I love it. Uh, but some words, you know, some words carry weight and have a certain life after their own. Uh, in the beginning, I confess to you, between David and Saul, I prefer Saul. Saul, I liked Saul. He was a dreamer. Furthermore, he didn't want to be king. This poor man, all he wanted was to be a good son that uh, his father lost the donkey, so he went to look for donkeys. <laughs> and the text even says so, that while looking for donkeys, he found the kingdom. <laughs> I, I can imagine, I can almost imagine, you know, Samuel comes and says, you will be king. Are you crazy? Are you crazy? Me, a king? Give me my donkeys. <laughs> so I really felt much more for Saul. And I wasn't pleased with the punishment. And he didn't want to kill the enemy, Agag, the king of the enemy of the Amalekites. I found it human. It's human not to kill. If I have to err, I would rather err on, 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 on the side of, of compassion, not of cruelty. So I was all out for so. And I felt that uh, David, uh, he was a bit too pushy anyway. Too pushy for me. And of course, and the story of the it was wrong. Not only to, to, to take Bathsheba, but to send her husband with his death sentence in the envelope. Death sentence. No, as, if, as if he wanted you know, to, to push the, the absurdity, the cruel absurdity to, to the end, he gave him his own death sentence. And he said, give it to the officer. But of course it was written there, send it to the front line. So, that he, so he could marry Bathsheba. But he was punished for that. He was punished. He couldn't build the temple. The temple was built by Solomon, his son, not by David. For that reason, David spoke. The, 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 the beauty in the text, the Bible too, that all of our ancestors, our common ancestors, were human beings. They all had weaknesses, shortcomings. You, you, you couldn't find the perfect human being. Even Moses, who after all, he got, he got the law, he spoke to God face to face. Even Moses, that's why he couldn't enter the Holy Land, because he had weaknesses. Which means a human being who doesn't have weaknesses is not human. And a human being who is not human, something is wrong with that person. And therefore, I think David really was the king of kings, actually. Uh, he was the king, the Messiah must be his descendant that even David could transgress the law. Even he therefore be careful. So he was not such, but nevertheless, why do I like him? First, because he was a poet. You know, Solomon wrote philosophy. Uh, Ecclesiastes. Yes. But David wrote the Psalms. Poetry, sheer poetry. And furthermore, and here it comes really, Saul, at the end of his life, hated. And he wanted to kill him. Had Saul caught David, there is no doubt that he would have executed him. There's no doubt. David could have killed Saul more than once. Remember when he entered the tent and even cut a piece of his and David didn't. So therefore David actually, in spite of his mistakes and his weaknesses and his shortcomings, remains the greater. One can be great in spite of occasional weaknesses. That doesn't mean that I am now on the side of all our presidents who do occasionally do certain things, you know, but... Yes, who is I think... Please. I can hear you, Megan?
possession lies God who is not really rational. Again, I have problems with God. I, I, if, if you have had the occasion and the time occasionally to read some of my writings, I have not made peace with God. When I was young, younger than you, even I was very, very You cannot imagine what it meant to be so religious in my little town where, where there was nothing but, to me, it was nothing but God. I, all my studies don't take an example. I, I couldn't care less about secular studies. So don't follow me. You cannot imagine for me to study mathematics or geography was so horrible. Oh, what do I care that two times two is four? Well, let it be five. Makes a difference. Five. Except one month usually before the exam, so I quickly rehearse quickly everything, and the moment I pass the exam, I forgot everything there. My life really was only with religious studies. And uh, strangely enough, even during when I was there inside, and I was then 16, I did not lose my faith inside. I had a co-worker, and I remember him because I saw his neck only, we would carry rocks. And he used to be, before the war, he was a, the head of, of, of a yeshiva, of Tamulipi school. And I had known enough to study with he became a teacher of mine there. While we were working and carrying these stones back and forth, he was studying. Someone managed to sneak in a pair of phylacteries. And my father and I would get up very early in the morning to stand in line, out of the sleep, and would say the prayers of the, the phylacteries. So even then, it's only later, after the war in France, I really became less religious as before. I studied, I, I, I took the tractate of the Talmud and at the page that I had left, wanted to continue. As if it were, on my, on my part, a kind of desire to show God, look, I have to tell you something. I will continue no matter what. Later came the crisis. You call that, the psychiatry, the latency period. The latency period was over, but then it breaks up. So I, like all my questions I had as well, all of them remained over. I have problems with God, it should not affect negatively anyone else. Because I have no right to make anyone suffer simply because I have problems with God. Which means I believe now that the Bible, the text that you have studied, is really a guide for human relations. If I want to come close to God, I have to come closer to you. I move away from you, I move away from God. Whether God likes it or not, I'm not there. I don't know. It's a painful statement, that's true. Oh, All of you are only, only girls, students have questions. I must tell you something. <laughs> what is your name? Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> It was a good question. <laughs> I'm sorry. Because there are so many. Look at the. Uh, I, I didn't hear your name. Holly. Holly. Um, with everything that you've seen and everything that's happening right now, do you think that mankind is in the whole I knew more, really. I am not a general. I, I, I met generals. I don't know anything about military matters. Instinctively, I'm against violence. And I, I, I believe so much in, in, in dialogue. I think words are more important than deeds in that case. If I want to do something, I don't have to kill or to, or to inflict injury on anyone. I want to speak. 
But then, when language fails, violence becomes a language. And I'm, I'm, I'm convinced that that's why violence has set in, because somehow we have not found the real versions. Is it is that hope? I'm teaching a class now, you know, two classes, one in literature and one in philosophy. And the title is, I told you, The Despair and Hope in, from Antiquity to Modern Times. And despair is all around us. So where is hope to be found? So we try to find it, of course, in the texts. But the text in itself is not enough. I can find it in the text if we study the same text, should I? Then somehow the fact that we study that text together, that it brings us closer, that would be already a spark of hope. For the moment, I'm going around with a very heavy heart. Oh, you must accept it. I don't see where we are going. What uh, happened in, 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 in New York and what may happen? To be, you know, he lived now in the second show, the third show to drop. It won't end, it will continue. And then what? what? What do they want to prove? I don't know what they want to prove. Those who, who, who do this thing, I don't know. So I'm. I have rarely felt really as, as, as not hopeless, I, I, I force myself to have hope. But as lost, I don't know where we are, where this century is going. Uh, I was convinced that the 20th century, when it ended, it will force you century to be. It is forced because of the weight of its memories, the weight will be there to force you, you young people, to find something, be imaginative. You force us to be better. You don't want a century like the 20th century, with, with absurd killings. And here you are, all of a sudden, you know, the, the, the key word the last 10 years was globalization. And now we have global fear and global terror. Talk now about bacteriological terror every single day. You know, I was going around with that fear for years. I, I, I was afraid of the terror. I was terrorized by terror. And therefore, I, I worked on it. I, 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 I did a, a real research on that for myself, first of all. What is terror? Where does it come from? When did it begin? Was Caligula a terrorist? And, uh, Robespierre, what is the difference between Robespierre and Caligula? And what is the psychology of a terrorist? The politics of a terrorist? What is the, the, the goal of a terrorist? It's the theology of a terrorist. And some three months ago, I offered it, I wrote an essay, and I wrote it, offered it to a weekly in France called Le Point. The editor in chief is a member of the Academy in Paris, which I'm the president, called the Universal Academy of Cultures in Turin. He said to me, Ellie, Come on, now, what do you want to write about this? It's, it's, it's not popular, it's nothing, nobody cares about them. No, no, well, well. <laughs> no, it's, he published it, uh, because it's me. He said, I'll publish it because it's you, otherwise I wouldn't have published it. No one wants to read about that. <laughs> and then, I've met, in my work, I have met many presidents. I, I, I served under five presidents here. And when I go abroad, I meet presidents and prime ministers. For the last 12 or 15 years, each time I meet a president of, or prime minister, I ask him that question about terror, and nuclear terror, and bacteriological terror. And nobody had come up with an answer of how to prevent it. Now I think they are working very hard on that. What a price to pay. And yet, if you read my books, my favorite expression is and yet. Which means, and yet, look, it's bad. But uh, we cannot leave it like that. It means we must invent hope. Camus said, when there is no hope, you must invent it. So we'll invent it. I say it, of course I say it. I do. Of course I do. But you think I'm explaining to that? Not about, not, 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 not about uh, a good meal. Uh, but look, I, I know very well my limitations. Nevertheless, I speak, I 
I speak, I have no choice. I wouldn't be able to, to live with myself if I didn't speak, so I speak. But I go, I do speak. Job? That's right. That's right. That's why Job remains, you know, I spoke with, 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 with you dear before. The beauty in this, in, in Job's especially, is we need Job for his language. We need him because he gives us words. You know, strong. We use his words. Yes, please. I can't see. Yes, Cassandra. What do you think that the Bible has to offer? Oh, I would simply say study. This is my mind. But whatever the answer is, study is its major component. Before, before the non-believer, or even the believer, the believer who doesn't study the Bible like that, he's losing something. The same is the non-believer. I would say to the non-believer, read it. Study it, study it in, in depth. I mean, you will find, first of all, beauty in it. If you study the Bible really, there is so much beauty in it. Cruelty, by the way, too. But, but the text about it is very beautiful. As a literary text, and as, of course, a philosophy. So they have one story, of course, about attacking and counter-attacking, but what, what, what is defense and what is offensive, right? In those times, in antiquity, it was life and death. But the Philistines were, were kind of hereditary enemy of, of, of the Israelites. And it was life or death. Maybe it should have been, okay, go ahead, take it. But they cannot. Because David, and also remember one thing, David, as a king, anointed by God, had a mission. It was God's word always saying, go and do this and this, through Samuel, by the way, always through Samuel, go and do this and that. But uh, or the other prophet, or Nathan. Now, today is a different story. Today, I don't know what to do with the truth. Because I, I don't have access to any intelligence sources. I don't know what, what it means to come to attack, to bring ships and hundreds of thousands of people and so forth. To, to, to Afghanistan. Maybe they, maybe if I were a general, I would, I would speak that way. I don't know. I must, one thing I do, I do know, that those terrorists have to be stopped. Because what we hear now, what I hear now, is that they are preparing the bio, bio terrorism. I, got, I, I, I don't want even to tell you what I know. I have a friend who is, Nobel Prize winner in chemistry and biology. And if I began being so concerned, obsessed with that, it's because of him. He is a, he is a liberal like myself, he's involved in human rights like myself. And he, one day, I said to him, no, I'm afraid of nuclear terror. He said, don't worry. Nuclear terror can be discovered because of, they have the, the machines, the instruments to discover the nuclear reactor or, or even nuclear bomb. The guy here is not not bio, biological warfare. And what he told me, I want you to know, it's too, too, too horrifying. So therefore, they have to be stopped. If I were the president, I don't know what I would do. If I knew all that, he knows more than I do. So therefore, I think, I only hope, my great hope is that they will be my wish, that somehow innocent people should not die. And I would even 
tried if I could, I would simply take them to prison. I would come back against capital punishment. It's not easy. It's not easy because we are, now we are dealing really with a few people who can do maximum damage. Because of the, it is, the, 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 in the Bible, the Genesis, you speak about this, what is it called, the, third of the sword, which is a double sword or something, double-edged sword. <coughs> that is, science today is a double-edged sword. It can save and kill faster than at any other time that I think history. So on one hand, in medicine, I love the medical schools. Because really, they, they save life. On the other hand, look at what science can do with one, on one way of using that say, certain, certain biological law. That's why I bet we have, but I don't really have that real answer, because I don't know that. One more. Times what the philosophers tried to prove God's existence, and I always found it ridiculous. <laughs> if you can't prove, that means you don't believe it. It's faith. If you have faith, then the question is answered. And if you don't, that is nothing. Of nothing rational. I found in philosophy, and I was a student of philosophy, I found absolutely no rational uh, way of explaining God's existence. So if somebody doesn't have faith, I expect that person to. I am not God's policeman. Really not. A person has faith. If that faith is a, an enveloping faith of solidarity, meaning when I say my faith is faith, the person says, well, I don't believe in God. Well, as long as you don't want me to be like you. But uh, the, main thing, the main thing is, you watch again. Thank God for a young, beautiful and good, eager to learn. Try to see in somebody else's faith a way of affirming his or her humanity just as you try to affirm yours. It's not a faith in God that's so very important. It's not the faith in one another. The neighbor, the person who speaks behind you. I, I don't want, I, I don't even want my face, I don't want a person to see an enemy in a person. I don't want to see in a play and wonder whether he or she does maybe has a dagger or a simple pen knife. I don't want that. I want to smile at the person who is next to me and to talk to that person and listen to that person without 